your Bibles, please, and stand with me as we turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 60. This is a message that everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit has told me that everywhere I go, every church I go to, every conference, wherever I go, I'm to preach this. Some of you may have heard this message before, if you've heard me preach before, but I want you to hear it again. This is a word from the Lord. It's a strong word. I want to warn you before I preach tonight that um, this is a strong word from God. I want you to hear it. God's not playing with us anymore. He's let us go through a famine to show us just how bad we need Him. Churches all across America has gone through times where they wondered, why in the name of God am I going to church? What's there? They knew the Lord was real. They knew His Word was true. But so many people across America now have been just going to church perfunctorily and not really getting much out of it and not really seeing much reality of the power of God in their life on a day-to-day -day basis. We've been through a famine. And I want to tell you something else. I believe with all my heart that most, the greatest majority of the American church, including Pentecostals, have been backslid and many of them didn't even know it. So I want to talk about that tonight and I want you to let God talk to your heart. I'm going to cover seven areas and I'll go through them as quickly as possible. I know many of you have to get up and go to work in the morning and I'm going to keep that in my heart. But at the same time, we don't get shots like this ever so, you know, we don't get them too often like this. And so whenever we uh, come, we want to make the most out of it. We want to talk to you about what God's doing and what God wants to do in your life. At the end of the service, I'm going to be praying for you. If you want prayer, get your mind off of me and get your mind on the Lord. Because there's no man yet been able to do nothing for you, friend. It's God. And uh, you may go to the floor and you may not go to the floor. The issue is not going to the floor. The issue is letting God touch your heart. And uh, if you get sa if you get touched... If you get delivered, if you get healed, whatever happens to you tonight, God will do it, and it won't be me. So I want you to know that. But there is an anointing, and there is an outpouring, and there is an impartation of the Holy Spirit that's taking place. I don't understand all of it. I'm a participant with it. It happened to me. And everywhere we go, and I just want to tell you this in confidence, that everywhere we go, no matter if it's Brownsville or outside Brownsville, uh, wherever we go, Steve and I go out together, or if I go separately, anytime we open up after the altar call, we're going to give an altar call tonight too for those of you that need to come back to God. Those of you that need to come to God for the first time, we're going to give an altar call. But after the altar call, we're going to open up the front of this building. And we're going to be praying for people. And I've never been out one time that that river didn't begin to flow. And many of you will feel it. It is a literal river. It has a literal current. And it's wonderful. It's the power of God. It's the glory of God. It's wonderful. But I want to tell you this, it comes from the Lord. So don't get your mind on the current. Don't get your mind on the river. Get your mind on God. It all comes from Him, okay? Isaiah chapter number 60, it says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon you, and His glory shall be seen upon you. You may be seated. I want to tell you three quick things about the glory of the Lord. I'm going to tell you three quick things. How many of you tonight wants to hear truth? I know you didn't come to be entertained, and I know you came to hear the truth, so I want you to get ready to hear some truth. It may hurt you, it may sting you a little bit, it may embarrass you, but I want you to get ready to hear some truth because God's going to talk to all of us. One thing that I had to do is I had to unexpectedly learn a crash course on God's glory. No, it's not anything separate or extracurricular from the Word. It's not anything separate from God, but it is part of God Himself. The glory of the Lord is powerful. I had to learn a crash course on God's glory, and it started with me on Father's Day. We've heard so much about anointing. We've heard so much about authority. We've heard a lot about confession. 
We've heard a lot about the faith walk and all those things I think are important and powerful. But the one thing that God is doing in these days is He's trying to introduce His people once again as He did even in the Old Testament. He's trying to introduce us once again to His glory. There's three th quick things I want to tell you about the glory. Number one, God desires to manifest His glory on His people. That's His desire. The Bible says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold darkness. It says, The darkness shall cover the earth. How many of you feel at times like darkness is now covering the earth? How many of you feel that way? I want to tell you, friend, there is a darkness today that is covering the earth. There is two parallels taking place. One is that wickedness and evil is waxing worse and worse. It's not getting any better. And it will not get any better. There is coming a man by the name of Antichrist. There is coming a time called Jacob's Trouble, a seven-year period that God has set aside called the Tribulation and the Great Tribulation. It will culminate in Armageddon. It's going to be a hellish time. Right now we are eclipsing, and we're beginning to blend. This dispensation of grace is coming to a close, and now we're beginning to slice into and to fade into that time of Jacob's trouble. We're right at the coming of the Lord. I believe that this, that this revival that God has sent, not only to Brownsville, but other parts of the world, I believe that this revival may be the last end-time revival that we've all heard preached about all of our life that's been in Pentecost. I believe that that may be part of it. Brownsville may be part of it, but God's moving also in other parts of the world and America. So God desires to manifest His glory, but He says darkness is going to come. And He said it's going to cover the earth, and He said gross darkness to people. Whenever He said gross darkness to people, what do you think He means by that? He means gross darkness is going to cover people. And friend, I want to tell you something tonight. I don't know if you know or if you've experienced it, but I have been in the ministry long enough that I have now begun to experience God letting gross darkness come upon people. I've never seen people so deceived and blinded as they are today. I've never seen humanity so hopeless and so helpless as they are today. The reason why people start gathering outside of Brownsville Assembly of God at 4 o'clock every morning now, they start gathering at 4 o'clock in the morning. Our services are over at midnight to 1 o'clock. At 4 o'clock in the morning, a new crew is coming from around the world and across America, and they start gathering at 4 o'clock. By noon, there'll be a 1,000 people outside. By 6 o'clock, there'll be thousands of people outside waiting to get in the church when the doors open at 6 o'clock. And whenever I see people gathering like that, and they come, and there's such hunger, people are so desperate today for God like I've never seen, because gross darkness is even now, while I speak, intensifying and darkening and thickening over humanity. But the Lord said, as darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people, I will let my glory rise upon you and I will cause you to shine. One thing I noticed right off the bat about this revival, and it was odd, Whenever God moved in there on Father's Day, it was the most awesome thing I have ever beheld. And I won't go into the details because there's too many details and it's too awesome to really try to talk about it in a few minutes. I would just eat up a lot of time. I've never dreamed that I could feel God and experience God for one day, much less going on 18 months now, every night. It's the most awesome thing. I used to feel God powerfully and I'd go through cycles where I'd feel him and where I didn't feel him. I'm being honest with you. And I would preach even though I didn't feel him. And God would be faithful and he'd come through and he'd anoint me to a degree, just like he would any other preacher. But I never dreamed it was possible to feel God that consistently. And to even have him in home. Not just at church, but at home too. And one of the things I noticed as soon as revival was poured out is that God began to touch people's lives powerfully. I mean powerfully. People that I've pastored for years. I've been, I will be the pastor at Brownsville for 15 years this coming February. 
I'll be there 15 years. So I know these people. And I know that I've seen people that's never moved ever. Good people. Christian people. People of integrity and character. A good testimony. But they never were moved by anything. Brownsville's always been a steady church. Not moved by every wind of doctrine. Not moved by sensationalism. Just steady. But people that had depth and love God. But on Father's Day of 1995, it was just like dynamite exploded in that church and bodies were being hurled every which way. Bodies were flying to the left, they were flying to the right. It was like somebody pulled a, a pin on a grenade and tossed it out in the audience on that section and bodies were just going everywhere down in the spirit. And then, bam, over here in the middle sections of the church, they were just flying every which way. And then, bam, over there in that section, people were just falling everywhere. Nobody was touching them. The power of God just moved in like a bulldozer. And it was awesome. I've been in a church all my life, and I've never seen anything like it. And so in the subsequent weeks to come after that, I, we, I'm telling you, the rumor of what God started on Father's Day began to spread, and instantly the crowds were there. Instantly. There's never been one service since Father's Day of 1995, that morning service, there's never been one day that church hasn't been completely full. People in the balcony, everywhere. It's been full every time. Last Friday night was the largest church service we've ever had. Eighteen months later, it was the largest service we've ever had. 7,500 people there. They were in all the buildings. They were sitting in the floor. They were sitting on the stage. They were sitting in the floor at the chapel. They were in Sunday school rooms. They were up the hallways. And they were outside in the grass. 7,500 people. And my, did the glory of God even come down then. God's not impressed with crowds, friend. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them, saith the Lord. But I've never seen people so hungry as they are today for God. People are starving for God. They're, they're looking for reality. And friend, let me tell you something. Today, the world is turning to psychic readers, and they're turning to witches, and they're turning to wizards, and they're turning to New Age and the occult and astrology but the people that know their God are turning to the Lord like I've never seen. People are hungry for God today. People will drive, they will fly, they will swim, they will hike, they'll do whatever they have to do to get to where they think God is moving. People's hungry after God. And I tell you, God wants you to be hungry after Him. I believe the prerequisite for revival is hunger. But one thing I begin to notice right off the bat I began to hear this and it kept coming to me. I heard it from the choir. I heard it from the worship team. I heard it from the staff. I heard it from church people. And I began to investigate it. And that's why the Lord gave me this message. And He said, Son, everywhere you go, I want you to preach this message. And here's what I began to hear. Families that would lay on the carpet together. Families that would be out in the Spirit, under the power of God. Really out in the Spirit. Not faking it, not putting on, but I mean out down for the count for hours when that thing first broke out on Father's Day for months after that I'll say weeks and weeks and weeks after that Steve and I many times would leave at 5 o'clock in the morning 4, 5, 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning many mornings we'd leave and the sun would already be coming up in the east when we crank up our car and pull away and we'd been there since 7 o'clock the night before you couldn't leave Friend, you'd be praying for people like down this aisle for example there'd just be people everywhere and you'd be praying for people and an unseen force of the power of God would come in and you could feel it coming past you. Sometimes you could feel it going through you. Absolutely through you. Like a wind. And like a river would come through you. And as it would begin to come through you, it would hit that crowd that you was about to pray for. And everybody like dominoes would topple. And you wouldn't say anything. It would just happen. And they would be down for hours. And you couldn't get them up under the power of God. I mean the chiefest of sinners coming and getting saved. Chiefest of sinners. God drawing them like a bug to a light and getting them in there and saving them and cleaning them up and filling them with the power of the Holy Ghost. And another thing I noticed, just like the other night in baptismal pool, we have baptismals on Friday night, and the last Friday night was so powerful. Friday night was a week ago. They had two lesbians that worked at a big place in Pensacola. I won't call the name of the place. And one of their supervisors was sitting on the platform that goes to our church, and I've been pastoring her for years. 
And she heard them testify in the baptismal pool. When she saw them in the baptismal pool, she looked up like, these were lesbians that had been living together for years and were blatant with it, militant lesbians. They would stick it in your face that they were living together and what you going to say about it? And they raised children together. And they stood there, one out, they stood there separately. They didn't get in the pool together, but they stood there and wept and sobbed and shook under the power of God in that baptismal pool and repented and said, I'm so sorry that I've lived the life of a lesbian. I was unhappy the whole time. And I felt the judgment of God. And I wanted to turn, but I couldn't turn. But when I came to the altar, God broke that power of lesbianism off of me. God broke it off of me. And the woman said, I called my son up after I got saved. And I said, son, can you ever forgive mama for raising you in that hell hole? And she said her little boy that she raised up in that hell, in that mess of lesbianism, said to her, Mama, my prayers have been answered. <laughs> right behind her came the other lesbian that was her lover for all those years. And the power of God was all over her, and she was shaking on the power of God. Both of them, you see, friend, what's been happening is so many people have felt the weight of the penalty of their sin, but there was not enough power there to lay the axe to the root of their sin. You see, there's a difference in the penalty of sin and the power of sin. The Bible said, let not sin therefore have dominion over you. It's one thing to be worried about sin, but it's quite another thing to have the power of that thing broken over your life. There's as many homosexuals in church congregations as there is in the world. There's as much divorce in the church as there is in the world. There's as much illegitimate children being born in the church as there is out there in the world. And they hate their sin, but they didn't have the power to turn from it. But I've got news for you. God is showing up. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's showing up, friend. By the power of the Spirit of God. And now, He's not only forgiving us of the penalty of this thing, but He's breaking the back of the power of that sin over us. Pornographers that have been hooked on pornography all their life are being delivered miraculously by the power of God. Friend, I'm going to tell you, a leopard cannot change his spots. But you let the Holy Ghost get a hold of that leopard and he can make whatever he wants to out of it. God can take a soul on the way to kill Christians. He's a murderer. He's a blasphemer. And he's breathing out curses under his breath. And God can touch him in a split second and make him write most of the New Testament in your Bible. Friend, I want to tell you, if you've got children that's away from God, and if you've got kids that's backslid, and maybe you don't know where in the name of God they are, the Holy Ghost knows where they are. And I'll tell you, the Lord will get them, He'll arrest them, He'll apprehend them, He'll change them, He'll turn them around, and He'll set their feet on higher ground. You better hear me, I know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Ghost. Say it with me. Come, Holy Ghost. Say it again. Come, Holy Ghost. I'm so tired of dead religion. I'm so tired of three songs and an offering and prayer request and a little sermon. I'm so sick of it. I don't know what to do, friend. I got so burnt out on it. I got so burnt out on it. One morning I was getting ready for church and I walked out on my back porch and I said to the Lord before revival broke out, I said, God, I'm so sick of this religious church mess until for the first time in my life I don't want to go to church this morning. And I had to preach. I wasn't backslid. I was still praying. But it wasn't time yet. Sometime we get so highfalutin and big for our britches. And we think we know how to have church without the Lord. The Lord will pull back and let us have it. But friend, I got so sick of it. I said, God, if you don't show up, I'm out of here. I'd rather pump gas or sweep floors for some corporation than to go through the ministry without the power of the Holy Ghost. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. I tell you what, I feel sorry for pastors because I am one. I feel for sorry for pastors whose churches don't want to go with the move of God. They're bucking against the very thing that they need. They're bucking against the very thing that's going to be the lifeblood of the church in these last days. And I tell you, if you'll pray and get a hold of God, just two or three of you, God can send a fire and turn that whole thing around. Well, hallelujah. Anyway. I got to hearing this and I got to hearing that and I said, something's wrong. I'd see people that had been on the floor for hours and they'd say on the way home, they'd get in a fight. And they thought for a while, you know, it's just the devil fighting them. You know, we got so blessed at church, well, it's just the devil. And then I got to hearing it more and more and I got to say, well, Lord, what is it? Because before revival broke out, the glory of the Lord had already begun to come in our home. My wife got to where she couldn't even get up out of her chair in the den for hours at a time before revival broke out in Brownsville. I saw God all over her. It made me hungry. She had been touched mightily by God. I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere and I couldn't do anything. I was stuck with my mother that was dying. But God had touched Brenda. I'd sent her off somewhere. And she got mightily touched by the power of God. It was awesome. And it made me so hungry. And uh, so the glory of the Lord already moved in our home before revival broke out. So when revival broke out, our home was an extension of the church. But I began to hear people say on the way home from church that they'd be fighting and fuming and fussing. Before the garage door would go up, when they pull up in the driveway, before they stick the key in the door and unlock the door, they'd be at each other's throats. And by the time they get in the house, they'd be pouting. And they'd go to bed and she'd be on her side and he'd be on his side. And the kids would be back there sniveling and crying. Because mom and dad had been had a big fight, or they had a big fight with the kids, and then they almost backed out and coming to church the next night. But they came to church the next night, got blessed again in the floor, couldn't stand up, apologized to one another, felt horrible about the night before, and then a day or two later, the same thing happened again. And so they said, "God, are we hypocrites? What's wrong with us? Are we living one way at church, and when we get home, we can't get along anymore? Are we misfits? Is it time to divorce?" That's what people begin to reason, see. You see, there's a problem. People begin to reason in the natural. We need to divorce. You might need to reason like this. The devil needs to be kicked out of your house. You know, friend, let me tell you something. One of these days, whenever the Lord binds the devil, the lion that is vicious is going to look at a lamb laying right under his mouth and is going to wonder, how come I'm not eating your head off? Because you see, Jesus is going to damn the false prophet and the beast and the antichrist and the devil himself. He's going to bind them all up and put them into hell. And that vicious lion that used to be so vicious is going to be nuzzled up and warming up to a little lamb. The problem is the devil. I said the problem is the devil. You probably got more devil in your home than you know about. I'm going to help you see it. I didn't got the offering, friend. I got a full tank of gas. Amen. Turn with me to Leviticus. I want to show you something. This to me is one of the most powerful passages in the, in the Scriptures. When I saw this years ago, this made such an impact on me, and I began preaching on it years ago. Now I understand there's books being written about it now, and that kind of thing. But I want to tell you something, friend. I was preaching on this a long time ago. I want you to hear this. God told Moses and Aaron, the high priest, Moses the leader and Aaron the high priest, he said, now listen, they hadn't come into the land of promise yet. They hadn't got into the land of promise. This was way before they got in there. But God got a hold of them, and he said, now look, I want to give you some instruction to give to the children of Israel so they have plenty of time to chew on this. Before they ever get into the land of promise where I'm going to take them, I'm going to give them houses they didn't build. You hear me? I'm going to give them houses they didn't construct. I'm going to give them vineyards they didn't put a shovel to. I'm going to give them wells they never augured. And the Lord said, now listen, before you get into that promised land, I want to give you something to think about. 
And I want this to be a memorial to you, and I want you to remember this when you finally come into the land of promise one day. And here's what he said. He said, if I put leprosy in a house that you're living in, when you get to the promised land, a house you didn't build, if I put a symptom of leprosy in a house, and he said, the way you'll know is it'll have green streaks and red streaks coming up from beneath the foundation up through the walls. And he said, if I put leprosy in a house, he said, you're to leave that house immediately and you're to go show it and tell the priest. You're to go tell the priest to get the priest to come and show him the house. If I put leprosy in a house. Now God said, if I put leprosy in a house. Leprosy in a house. He said, go tell the priest. So if they got up one morning and they looked in the walls and there was a green streak and a red streak coming up like a, like a snake up the wall. And they realized something was wrong. They remembered because Moses had plenty of time in the wilderness to tell them about this before they ever got in the promised land. They said, gee, Whitaker's looking there. Man, we're living in a house where there's green streaks and red streaks. And so the Bible says that they were to tell the priest and the priest would come out there and check their house out. And sure enough, when the priest would come out to the house and he would look and he would see those streaks, he'd say, all right, everybody out, empty the house close it up for seven days after they closed it up for seven days if he came back and those green streaks and red streaks had spread he would say this is a fretting leprosy or an angry leprosy it's active leprosy this means something's wrong in this house so the first thing they'd do step number one is they'd take the plaster off the walls and then they'd empty the dust of the plaster out in the dump on the outside of the city and then they'd shut it up again for a while and then after They'd come back and check, and, and the leprosy would spread again. He'd say, well, this is an angry leprosy, a fretting leprosy. Tear the house down. So they had to tear it down timber by timber. And interestingly enough, there was always something wrong. Whenever they began to tear the house down, it began to reveal and expose that something was wrong in the house. Look in Leviticus chapter 14. I want you to look at this passage of Scripture. This is so powerful. Verse 33. Leviticus 14, verse 33. The Lord spake unto Moses... And unto Aaron, saying, When you be come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession, he that owns the house shall come and tell the priest. Say, it seems to me there is, as it were, a plague in my house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to check it out. And all that's in the house be not made unclean. And afterward the priest shall go in and see the house. He shall look on the plague, and behold, that the plague is in the walls of the house with hollow streaks, green or red, which in sight are lower than the wall. The priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again the seventh day and shall look, and behold, if the plague is spread in the walls of the house, the priest shall command that they take away the stones which the plague is, and they shall cast them in an unclean place outside the city." And he shall cause the house to be scraped within, round about, and they shall pour out the scrapings of the dust that they scrape off the walls with outside the city into an unclean place. They shall take the other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other mortar and shall plaster the house again. If the plague comes again and breaks out in the house after he's taken away the stones, scraped the house, and after it's been plastered, then the priest shall come and look and behold, if the plague is spread in the house, it is a fretting leprosy in the house. The house is unclean. He shall break down the house. Stones, timber, mortar. They shall carry them forth outside the city into an unclean place. Moreover, he that goes into the house all the while that it shut up shall be unclean until the evening. He that lies in the house shall wash his clothes. He that eats in the house shall wash his clothes. And if the priest shall come in and look, and behold, the plague has not spread in the house. After the house was plastered, then the house, the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. And he shall take to cleanse the house. Look at this. Two birds, 
cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop, and shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water, and take the cedar wood, the hyssop, the scarlet, and the living bird, and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and the running water, and sprinkle the house seven times. He shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird, and with the running water, with the living bird, with the cedar wood, with the hyssop, and with the scarlet. But he shall let go the living bird out of the city into the open fields, and make atonement for the house, and it shall be clean. Interesting, isn't it? Now I want to show you something about this. I want you to give me your best ear for the next few minutes. He's talking about a blood sacrifice for a house, not a haunted house. I don't believe houses are haunted. I believe houses are oppressed of demons. There's no departed spirits, friend, living in a house after their body died. They're either in hell or heaven, I guarantee you. There ain't nobody living in no house 200 years later. There's demons in that house. That house is oppressed, but there ain't nobody there. Amen? Somebody shout amen. Amen. I don't care what the world tells you. I don't care what you saw on Unsolved Mysteries. I don't care anything about any of that stuff. It's not true. Go to the book, and the book will tell you what it's all about. But God said, if you have a house, and I've got green streaks and red streaks coming up that wall, I know something's there. And he talks about making atonement for a house. He's talking about atonement for a house, not atonement for a soul. Yes, there was atonement for souls in the Old Testament. Sure there was. But he's talking about in this passage of Scripture through Levitical law given to Moses and Aaron, if you have a house, I put leprosy there with symptoms of green streaks and red streaks. There's something wrong. Go show the priest. The priest comes back in. He says, my God, this is fretting leprosy. It's angry. Tear the house down. You know what would happen? Let me back up a little bit and tell you what happened. You see, all those years Israel wandered out there in the wilderness, 40 years the Canaanites had heard rumors that God was going to bring Israel out of Egypt in on them and usurp them out of the land of Canaan and was going to give Israel, the Canaanites, houses and wells and vineyards. For 40 years they lived under that rumor. And they knew there were three million Jews out there in that wilderness. They heard about the cloud by day. They heard about the pillar of fire by night. They heard about the, the 300 boxcars, railroad boxcars, a manna every morning. They heard all the stories. They knew God was moving among those people. But, I mean, it took a long time, 40 years. For 40 years, those Canaanites lived in fear that any moment they was going to come in on them. Well, after 40 years, it happened. But those Canaanites had 40 years. They were wicked they were evil and they were heathen. They did not serve the only true God. They served demon gods. And if you look in the rabbinical midrash, you will find that it's alluded to that whenever Israel came in to the land of Canaan, that many of those Canaanites had hoarded their gold and silver trying to hide it from the Israelis. And they would hide their gold and silver beneath the foundation of their homes. But before they would hide them, they would melt down the gold and silver and beat them into little demon gods and hide them under their houses. So whenever the walls of Jericho fell down and Israel routed all the Canaanites, they moved into their houses. Well, they're living there now for a few days, a few weeks, a few months. And one day they wake up and they look and say, My God, there's some, look at that green red streak in that wall there. Hey, I remember Moses telling us when we was out there in the wilderness. Hey, I remember something about that. Said, the, oh, oh yeah, go show the priest. So they go show the priest. They shut the house up and they come back. And if it would spread, they say, there's something wrong here. So they say, tear the house down. Many times when they tear down that house and they get down by the foundation and the walls of the house and beneath the foundation they'd find them little demon gods that they had beaten their gold and silver into little demon gods now you're sitting out there and you might be saying this why didn't God just let it go? because God's a holy God but Israel didn't know anything about it doesn't make any difference God knew God knew that where his sanctified peculiar holy people were living that he had brought out with a mighty hand under the blood through the water 
and given them signs and wonders, fire, all kinds of miracles. God knew that His miracle people was living in houses with demon gods buried underneath the house and in the walls of the house. And God said, I put leprosy in that house to show you. I see something you don't know about. And so when they'd tear down the houses, they'd find those demon gods hidden. And then they'd go back and rebuild the house, and then they had peace. I want to cover seven areas with you real quick, and I'm going to go through them quickly, about your home. Listen, don't make notes. Just pick up a tape. Just pick up a tape. Not my tape. The church here, we want the church to make the profit off of this tape. They'll make tapes for you. They'll have them available. You can just order them from Gary Wood Assembly. They'll get them for you. But listen to me. I'm going to give you seven areas real quick about your home. And I want to ask you seven questions about your home because this is what we begin to find out about Brownsville. They would leave the floor under the power of God, and before they got home, they was fighting. What was it about going home that caused them to be like this? I'm going to share seven things with you real quick. And this is what the Lord has told me to preach everywhere we go. Number one, what kind of company are you keeping? What kind of company are you keeping? See, I'm a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm a pastor. I live with people. I bury the dead, marry the living. I have board meetings. I know what it's like to be criticized, ridiculed. I know what it's like to face a vote. I know what it's like to be beat up in my office, whipped. I know what it's like to be criticized after you didn't do too good in a sermon. I know what it's like to get a raise and everybody in the church knows you got a raise and people start bickering and mouthing about it. I know what all that's about. I know what it's like for people to tear my wife down. I know what it's like for people to say about my little boys, oh, they've got dingo boots. I wish my boy could afford dingo boots. Maybe I need to get a raise. I know what it's all about, friend. I wasn't born yesterday. I've been pastoring a long time. But I want to tell you what will kill a church, and I'm going to tell you what will kill your home quicker than anything. You see, listen to me. In your home or in your church, it's either fertile or sterile. If it's fertile, there's life there and there's warmth there. If it's sterile, there's no life there and there's a lot of hell in your home. If your home is sterile, it's sterile for a reason. Because the blessings of God is not on it. And the blessings of God is not on a home because of a lot of different reasons, but the main thing is sin. If your home is fertile and the blessings of God are there, and your home is in order, your kids don't want to leave home when it comes time to get married. If your home is sterile, your kids can't wait to turn 18 to get out of there. If your home is sterile, nobody wants to have a meal around the table. They want to eat pizza in yonder. They want to eat in their bedroom. They want to eat around the, the bar, uh, up at the kitchen. They want to eat back in the den. Nobody wants to get together and be together as a family because as soon as you get together, you start to say, <laughs> is a sterility in your home. Something's wrong. Just as sure as I stand here, if God could open up your eyes, it'd be green streaks and red streaks in your house. And you know I'm telling you the truth. What kind of company are you keeping? Let me give you a typical Assembly of God Sunday night. After church on Sunday night, People have been there for the morning service and the night service. They get together afterwards and they call it fellowship. We're going to get together for a little bit of fellowship. You may go to Shoney's or you may go by and pick up some hamburgers and go home, kick your shoes off, wear back in the recliner, and here you go. Boy, Pastor sure struggled today, didn't he? You know, I remember when he first came to this church how on fire he was. I remember how anointed he was, and I remember we had the church was growing. But you know, the church has stopped growing now. Have you notice how the choir don't sing like they used to sing? And you notice this, that, and the other, and then the other one says, yeah, yeah, I've been noticing that, so forth and so on. And you know, the first thing you know, what you don't really realize is you're releasing curses out of your mouth. See, the Bible says we either release one or two things out of our mouth, blessings or curses. And if you're not releasing blessings, you're releasing curses. I didn't say cussing. Cussing, S-O-B, G-D, things like that, that's cussing. I'm talking about curses. You know what a curse is? 
speaking things you don't desire to come to pass. You know what blessings are? Speaking things you desire to come to pass. And you get together and it feels good to just sort of vent and say things, but you don't understand you're cursing your church and you're cursing your own home by talking like that. And you're causing sterility to come in your house. You're reared back, you got a Pepsi in your hand, you got your legs folded, your shoes off, and your sock feet. You're just as comfortable and you're just running off at the mouth with your so-called friends, and you call it fellowship. And it's no wonder the next time you walk through the doors of your church, the pastor studied, the pastors prayed, the pastors got in here and bore the burden. He sought God, he's believing God for revival. And you walk in here and you walk in and say, This thing seems so dead. Yeah, it really is. And you had a part to play in it. You've been cursing your own church. You've been cursing your own pastor. Come on. You've been cursing the church. You've been cursing your pastor. You've been cursing the choir. You've been cursing the board. You've been cursing the Christian Education Department. Just everything that you can think of to talk about, you just released curses all over it. And no wonder the next time you walk in, there's no warmth in that church. People sit there. They can't wait till the final amen. They're nodding. They're dozing. They're watching their watch. The place is sterile. Churches are either sterile or either they're fertile. If they're fertile, the singing is filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not talent. See, there's a big difference in talent and anointing. Somebody that don't really look too good and somebody that don't really sound too good can be powerfully anointed to sing. I tell you what, friend, I have become so sick and tired of the Ted Mack amateur hour in our churches where this one gets up behind the mic and tries to outdo the last one until I'm sick of it. I don't want no more star search in church. What we need is sunshine of the glory and the power of the Holy Ghost. I, I, I probably won't have time to cover all seven, but let me give you an illustration of your house. Dad comes in, he's undisciplined, he's unrestrained. He takes his boy, little teenage boy, that he ought to be loving and nurturing. And remember when he was a teenager himself. And he takes that little teenage boy up and he says, Come here, boy. What you been doing all day? I guess you've been laying around on your rear end all day, huh? You know, son, you make me sick. Matter of fact, you know what I think about you? I think that you're going to have a hard time making it in life. You better thank God you got me as a dad and you've got your mother as a mother because if you didn't have us, you'd be on the streets. I'll tell you something else. I guess one day you'll get your girlfriend pregnant and she's going to have a child and make me and your mother so embarrassed we won't even be able to go back to church or show our face in public anymore. The mother says to the daughter, Come here. Get out of that room back there and come here. The daughter comes out, 15 years old, having a hellish time within herself. And the mother says, I saw you got home last night at 10 minutes after 12. I guess you was in the back seat with that boy, wasn't you? Necking and making out all night. You know what I think? I think you're probably maybe pregnant. And I guess you're going to embarrass me and your father, and we're going to have to string you and your kids along all through your life. You know if that boy gets you pregnant, he's going to run off and leave you, and nobody will have you. And me and your dad's going to have to raise you and the youngins too. We're going to be so embarrassed. See what you're releasing in your home? Let me show you a difference. Come here, son. Put your arm around him. Son. I know you're having a struggle right now. You know, your mom and me loves you so much, baby. I remember when we took you to that man of God, Brother Wetzel, and he dedicated you to Jesus. I'll never forget that little outfit that you had on. Your mama made it with her own bare hands while she was pregnant. Couldn't wait till you got here, son. I remember those little booty things you had on while the preacher was praying over you. I saw your little legs just a-waving. I was so proud of you, and I still am so proud of you. Son, I know you're having a devilish time, but I want you to know Daddy's in your corner fighting for you, and I'm praying for you, baby. 
And you know what? One of these days, I know that you're going to make me and your mama so proud. God's going to send the right woman in your life. Son, you won't have to look around. God brought me up through the ranks, and he blessed me, and he, he took care of me. And now, you know what? We dedicated you to God, and God's going to take care of you too, son. Don't be too concerned. Don't get all uptight and anxious. God's going to bless you and take care of you. You see the difference? It's no wonder many times when you leave the church and God poured out His Spirit there and you head home. It's no wonder with all that mess being in your house when you get home, that same spirit of sterility grabs hold of you and you start fighting again. I think you get the picture, don't you? There's six other areas that I need to cover, but I've gone too long. Let me just give them to you real quick. I'll give them to you real quick. Is there lying in your house, dishonesty and deception in your house? Second thing is, is there lying, dishonesty and deception in your house? If there is, and you're not truthful and open, and you're lying, and you're deceiving, your house is sterile. And it will be sterile until you come clean. Thirdly, is there any kind of occultish witchcraft practices in your house or items, paraphernalia, symbols, or emblems in your house? I've never been so shocked in all my life as I was one day pastoring a Pentecostal church and a woman had been in my church for years and I thought was on fire for God. And she came up to me one day after I got through preaching and she said, you just really tickle me, preacher. I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, you just the cancer? I said, what do you mean? She said, you was born in July, wasn't you? You was born under the sign of cancer. I said, what? She said, yeah. She said, your wife is a Sagittarius. She's born in September, whatever it was. She said, she's a Sagittarius and y'all just fit the bill to the T. Y'all, you just don't know how you fit. I said, wait a minute. We're in a Pentecostal church with the so-called gifts and fruits of the power of the Holy Ghost moving, washed in the blood, and you're talking witchcraft in the aisle of my church. Friend, people read those books when they go home, put it down, and we'll pick up the Bible. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Come on, let's say it like it is. Something's wrong. Let's say it like it is. Look, let me tell you something. I don't know about other parts of the world, but the South knows the truth. The South, the Southern churches, knows the truth. You may act like you don't know the truth. You may pretend like you don't know the truth, but you know the truth. And we veer from God. And it's no wonder we don't have a move of the Holy Ghost in our churches. We backslid. Next. I'm going to close with this. And I don't have time to go any further. I feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit here so strong. Many of you are sitting out there right now, and in your mind, you see green streaks and red streaks up the wall of your house. You feel the cold, icy environment right now while I'm preaching in your house, and many of you is almost cringing thinking about going home tonight because you know your house is sterile. And I'm going to tell you why your house is sterile. There's sin there. Let me give you something else, friend. Listen to this. You say, uh-oh, he's one of them old holiness preachers. You got it right. I sure am. You know why? You know why? Because the Bible says without holiness, no man will see the Lord. I'm not talking about the length of your dress, friend. That's your business. I'm not talking about all these other things. That's your business. That's between you and God. But I'm going to preach holiness because, you know, the Bible says without holiness, no man will see God. I want you to see God. And I tell you, God is a holy God. And God knows what's in your house. And you may say, but oh, Brother Kilpatrick, he doesn't see that. He overlooks that. Does he? How come it is whenever we mighty on fire for God and you're having a great service at church and by the time you get home, hell's broke out again. Something's wrong in that house. It's sterile. Your house is sterile. I want to just take one thing here and I want to talk about it real quick and I want you just to think on something. You remember the days before television and the days before radio? America was a different place, wasn't it? I remember the first time I ever heard the word damn 
in a song, a secular song over the air. I remember the first time I ever heard it. And I thought, my God, what's America coming to? Who knew what America was coming to? And who knows where America's going yet? That's why the Bible says darkness is covering the earth and gross darkness to people. Friend, we better have revival. Do you hear me? I said we better have revival. If we don't have revival, there's an abyss. There is a black hole out there that's going to suck you in and your house. But God says, I want my glory to rise upon you. And I want you to be different. I want you to be a holy people, a peculiar people without spot or wrinkle. And I want to tell you something else. If you want the power of God in your life, you're going to have to live a different life from the world. You're going to have to quit going a whoring after the world and lusting after the world, trying to be like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, and look like the world. We're going to have to be the people of God. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. I would not have HBO in my house even for a ball game. I would not, I would not rent it just for an hour to watch a Tyson fight. I wouldn't do it. Let me tell you why. You remember back in the days of Lot? You remember it was so wicked in the days of Lot that the Bible says whenever the angels came in to warn Lot to leave, that the men of Sodom saw those angels going to Lot's house and they gathered around his house that evening and said, Lot! Lot came out toward the porch, toward the door. And when he walked out there, the men of the city, those homosexuals, said, We saw those strangers that already had everything else. So wicked and so perverse that already tested and tried everything else. We saw that strangers, a strange flesh, come to your house today. They said, Send them out that we may know them. Let me tell you how backslid you can get, friend. Let me tell you how lost you can get even in a Pentecostal church. Lot walked out and you know what he said? He said, now brethren. Now brethren. He should have said, you bunch of perverts. Amen. Now brethren, America is so backslid, we can't call black, black and white, white anymore. There is no middle ground, friend. It's either of God or it's of the devil. And today, it just makes me so sick. I want to throw up when I read in the paper that this denomination and that denomination is ordaining same-sex marriages and they got a man behind the pulpit that's a pervert and a homosexual and they voted to let him be the pastor because they said it's all right. God never said it's all right. The paper called me the other day from Pensacola and they said, we wanted to get your comment about homosexuality. They said, brother so-and-so across town said it was all right and there wasn't anything in the Bible against it in the New Testament. I said, well, maybe you ought to call that brother and tell him that God either died or God's asleep and he snuck that by God. Because it is in the Old Testament, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and it is in the book of Romans chapter 1. Read it in Romans chapter 1. They left the natural affections of the body and the natural use of the body, and men burned for men, and women burned for women. Read it. She said, what do you think about it? I said, I think about it what God thinks about it. They're going to bust hell wide open. And... I said, I'll tell you something else. So is the adulterers that don't repent, and so is the fornicators that don't repent, and so is the new agers that don't repent, and so is the good man that doesn't sin, what people call sin, but he doesn't live for God. He's going to bust hell wide open too. The issue is not what you're doing. The issue is not what is what you're not doing. You're not accepting the free gift of the blood of the Son of God as far as your Savior for your sins. That's the issue. So it's not just a homosexual issue. But Lot said, brethren, now brethren. You know what he said? I got two little grand boys, friends. I love them boys. My least little grand boys got a big head like I got. My wife said, you got the biggest head. When I get to heaven, I want to see your brains. 
My little grandson, when the doctor delivered both my grandsons, he said, my God, Karen, them boys got the biggest heads. Got a big old head sitting up in a little square, little, little shoulders, you know. Big old head. And uh, I love my little grandsons. They take that little plastic bat and hit that ball. They love for Poppy to see them play ball. Lot stood out there on that porch and he said, Now, brethren, he said, Now, don't act like this. He said, I got some daughters here in the house. Let me offer you one of my daughters. I don't know about you, but I want to punch Lot out whenever I hear him say that. Offer you one of my daughters. You know what I believe we'd have said unless we'd have been duped like he was? I want to tell you perverts one thing. You step another foot near this house and I will take a fence post or a bat or whatever I got and I will beat your brains out if you try to touch one of my daughters. Amen? Amen? But I want to tell you, you can get so backslid and so cold and think you're all right that you feel like you're even ready to go out and make a deal for God. You know what the angels did? They reached out from behind the door, laid hold on Lot, snatched him back in the house, and the angel walked out on the porch and said, and blinded all of them, and the perverts went home like this that night. They were blinded. The angels blinded them. Lot's out there trying to offer him his daughters, but the angels said, man, get in the house. We're just as bad today in the United States, friend. We subscribe to HBO. We subscribe to Showtime, to Cinemax. And we sit there and watch that garbage. And we laugh and we think it's all right. God said there's leprosy in your house. I said God said there's leprosy in your house, friend. On CBS, we watch the sitcoms. On NBC, on CNN, whatever, we watch the sitcoms where the homosexuals flit around. The homosexuals never got in Lot's house. The angels stopped it. But they're in the American Pentecostal and Christians' houses all over the world. How? Through cable and through antennas on top of our house, through that damnable television set. Somebody says, Pastor, are you advocating getting rid of the television? No! Because there's things that I believe you can watch on there that's good for you. There's some things that you can watch on there that's all right. You've got to have the discipline. But let me show you what happens with radio waves and, 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 and television waves. They're beamed out from a tower. They're beamed out. And they beamed out. They just go out like a vibration. Right now in this room, there's color TV pictures in this room right now. If I had an apparatus up here, I could set it right here. And I could tune in either Paul and Jan Crouch, a Christian television program, or I could tune in the Playboy channel right now. Either one. Those beams are in the air. But you know what? When America begins sending out that filth of the radio waves, when they begin sending out that filth of vulgarity and pornography, you know what it's like? It's like demons saw that going out and they jump up and they saddle those TV waves and they ride them right into your house. They saddle them. They jump right off on those TV waves just like that and they saddle them and they say, Hello, Silver, and they ride right in your house. And then you say, My God, my child, I don't know what's wrong with my child. I don't know what's wrong with my husband. He don't want to go to church no more. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What you got on your television? What's he sitting up watching at night when he's not in the bed with you? What's your kids watching at 3 o'clock in the morning whenever you see the lights on under the door in their bedroom that you never get up out of your lazy bed to go check and see what they're watching? You don't know what's being released in your house. What about the rock and roll music that comes in with all those damnable satanic lyrics and seductive fleshly lyrics coming into your kids, but you don't go in there and tell them to shut it off because you're more afraid of your kids than anybody. You don't want to offend them. You want to be your kid's best friend. God never called you to be your child's best friend. God called you to be their parent and their guardian. Somebody shout amen. You know what? Every time 
I preach this message, it gets quiet. You know why it gets quiet? There's sin in the church, friend. There's sin in your house. And there's demons riding those things right into the TV set through the cable. And it's going right in the walls of your house. You screw that thing in that cable in your wall, that's where the demon powers come in. And that's where your red streaks and green streaks are so many times. You know what? America, and I believe Brother John Loper's a man that preaches the Word. I know enough about him. But America hadn't heard this kind of preaching. America's ready to hear this kind of preaching. Because, you see, America's tried all that hell, and it's left them empty, and it's left them sterile. And they're looking around disoriented, and they're saying, there's got to be more. Friend, let me tell you, church isn't beautiful lights and a beautiful edifice and stained glass and a big budget and a big staff and a handsome preacher that's got great oratorical abilities. That's not church. Church is when we come together in the name of the Lord and God by His Spirit comes down and meets with us. <laughs> Hallelujah. And America is sick of it. They are sick, sick, sick of dead, dry religion, pablum, that never confronts people about sin in their life. They're sick of it. Our girls today, anorexic, bulimic, because they've looked in so many magazines, Self Magazine, Seventeen Magazine, Vogue, and they've seen such an image until they feel like they've got to look like that to be accepted by the world. Would to God they'd get a Bible in their hand and read about the virtuous woman. Read the Word of God. They'd get a hold of the Word of God and begin to read about different ones in the Scripture and get that mess off their minds. Well, I done made you mad now. You done got quiet on me. I'm through. I'm through. There's a couple more things that I could cover, but I don't have time. My time is gone. It's time to pray. But I want to tell you something. Let me, let, me, let me talk about one more real quick. I can't pass this one up. Pornography. How many men have I had say to me as their pastor, including some other preachers have said this to me, Brother Kilpatrick, I can't get stimulated anymore with my wife unless we watch an X-rated movie. That's the only way I can perform. So we rent videos from the video stores and when we watch those skin flicks, that gets me excited and I can perform sexually, but otherwise I can't anymore. It doesn't mean anything to me. How many men have said that to me? Thousands. Preachers have said that to me. If they're in that damnable shape, what kind of shape is the church in? Let me tell you something. When a man of God's behind the pulpit and he's in adultery, he releases that spirit of adultery all over that whole church. When he's behind that pulpit and he's a homosexual, he releases that spirit of homosexual all over that church. And if you come in that church and bring your kids and set them in that pew, you as a federal headship of your house have subjected your kids to a perverted spirit. It's time somebody told you that. It's time somebody gets up behind a pulpit in America on nationwide television and tells America that. Even if they cut your head off or shoot you in the heart, let them know. We're in a damnable shape. And let me tell you one more thing. Here's what Holy Spirit told me to tell churches everywhere I go. He said, I have sent my glory to the church. And he said, yes, my people got together and they prayed. And in the house of God, they became holy and repentant. And I've sent my glory and I've sent my power of revival to the church. But if they don't clean their houses up, the spirit of my glory will not last long in the church. I will withdraw it and I will send judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit told me to tell you. I'll say it again. The Lord said, yes, I have sent revival to the church. And yes, my people are being revived. But if they don't go home and clean their houses out and deal with sin in the house and get their houses in order, my glory will not rest in their homes. And if they won't let my glory come home with them, I will not continue to meet with them in my house at church. So here's the way it works. You light your fire at church, and God touches you and revives you. You take that fire home, 
and you drive the devil out of your house. You get rid of sin. You get rid of sin. If you're not willing to do it, you can forget revival. And if you can forget revival, gross darkness is going to come upon you, friend, and swallow you up like a black hole. Am I trying to scare you? I'm trying to tell you the truth. You see, before God sent revival, America was perilously close to judgment right then. But I believe God put the brakes on everything and, and He's heard some prayers and He's beginning to send His Spirit now. But if people come in here and sit piously on the pew and want to shake and fall on the floor and say, Whoo! Didn't the Lord touch me? And then go home and still live like a tyrant at home? Still be abusive to your wife and kids? Still be disrespectful to your husband? Still allow all that hell to come through the cable of your house? Still allow all those emblems to remain in your house? Still allow all those VCRs and those, those X-rated and vulgarity and pornography in your house? If you allow that and don't deal with it, God's going to withdraw His Spirit and judgment's going to come. Friend, it's no wonder to me that divorce is rampant in America because in our homes there's green streaks and red streaks on the wall. You can't see them, but they're there. You know they're there. Let me close with this. I want to ask you one question. You don't have to think about it. Just a snap answer will do. Is your house fertile where people want to be there? Where there's communion between the husband and wife in the marriage bed? Or have you lost that? Is there fertility in your kitchen where a warm meal is put on the table and everybody sits around and they're pleasant and they're loving? Or can you barely stand to sit at the table for 15 minutes and gulp down the food so you can get away from one another? How's your church? You come in and you suffer. You complain about having to stand 30 minutes for worship. And the worship leader's doing his dead level best to get something going. And you're standing there, one leg and the other leg saying, oh My God, I wish I could sit down. Pastor always gets these guys that leads these long worship services. You know what that is? That's a symptom that there's green streaks and red streaks in your church. If it was fertile, you couldn't stand there long enough and love on the Lord. You couldn't stand there long enough and love on the Lord. I want to ask you a question, and I'll close with this. How's your home? How's your home? Only you can answer that, friend. Before revival hit, I got to where I was going through my house, having communion in my house. I was not the doorpost. I was not my bedpost where we slept with the juice. I had clear grape juice. <laughs> I know the lentil and I know the doorpost. And I go in and speak a blessing over my bedroom, over the bed where me and my wife sleeps and have communion together. I speak it over the den, I speak it over the bathroom, I speak it over the kitchen. There's blessings that you can speak in your house, it's in Scripture. You can speak blessings of health, you can speak blessings of fellowship and joy, companionship. There's all kind of blessings you can speak. And I began to speak blessings. And we began to have communion. And the glory of the Lord moved in our house. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Let me tell you this real quick, and I promise you I'll close. Before revival broke out, well, right after revival broke out, we lost our privacy. So many people coming in from all over the world. I go out early in the morning get my paper, and there'll be people sitting outside on the street blowing their horn at me when I go out to get the paper early in the morning. We lost our privacy. You know, people didn't have nothing to do all day. They hear from all over the world. They want to see where the preacher lives. <laughs> So uh, we sold our house after living there for 14 years. We sold our home. And we moved out in the country. We lived right by the airport. We used to. And uh, we traded the noise of the airplanes for crickets. We moved in the country now. And uh, God blessed us with a, a home out in the country. It's so peaceful. But when we went to sell our home, there's a lady in our church who's a real estate agent. <clears throat> she listed our house for us. We put it on the market. And so she works for one of the biggest real estate companies in Pensacola. And whenever they go out to look at a house, she didn't even tell them whose house it was. And our house, just a normal house. It was only like 2,000 square feet, eight foot ceilings, just a regular small den, three bedrooms and a small little office I had there in the house. It wasn't anything fancy at all. If you saw it, you'd be surprised. And so the uh, real estate agent 
said that whenever they go out to see a house, they all load up on a van and they'll pull up in front of a house, they'll unlock the door and they'll go through, just walk through, you know, and they walk out the back door. They just make a walk through and they're gone. She said, Pastor, when we came to this house, she said, I didn't tell them whose house it was. She said, they unlocked the door and we walked in and she said, everybody stopped. And she said, I saw men that had never spoken to other men in the office lean up on the mantle on your fireplace and stand there and talk for 15 minutes. She said, then I saw different women begin to move through the house and some of them got in the bathroom, in your ba bathroom, in the bedroom bathroom, master bedroom bathroom, and they stayed in there 15 minutes just talking, had their arm around one another and everything in your bathroom just talking. She said, they stayed at your house over 30 minutes. You know what happened? That woman, that real estate woman bought our house. She bought our house. She bought it. But see, the glory had moved in our home. See, there was a day in America when the glory of God, when, our, when America served God, that the glory of God was in our home. Why do people like to watch the Waltons? Because it reminds them of the glory that used to be in the American homes. The porches, the swings, the fellowship, and the watching the kids grow up, marking the doors, how they were growing, you know. Daddy out working, mom and they're taking care of the family. It was a it was a symbol of the glory of the Lord. They'd read their Bible, you know, Grandpa. They'd talk about the things of the Lord sometimes. But in America today, the glory is not in our home. There's hell in our home. I'm going to ask you, as the musicians come back, nobody bow your head, nobody. Keep your eyes wide open. We don't do this hiding and do this on the sly. What we're going to do right now, we're going to do before God. The Holy Ghost is talking to you, ladies and gentlemen. He's trying to get a hold of you. He's trying to get a hold of you about your church. And he's trying to get a hold of you about your house, your home. There's some men in this place. You've talked to your boys just like I talked a while ago. You've talked to your daughters, some of you ladies, just like I talked a while ago. Some of you ladies, when I was doing that, you dropped your head because you've heard your husband talk to your son or your daughter like that. I saw some of you men drop your heads. When I talked about pornography and when I talked about different things that I talked about, I saw heads drop all over this whole church. You know who we are? You know who we are? My God, friend, do you know who we are? We've come here tonight because we want the Lord. But I just brought up a few simple things and I saw heads drop. If this is in us, what is it out there in the world? What is it out there in the world? It's no wonder the church had not had revival. My God, we've been backslidden and didn't even know it. It comes in so slow. How many homes are busted up and a man's already wound up with some other woman or a woman's already wound up with some other man? Their life is messed up. How many homes are busted up because their houses went sterile? You see, God's got life fixed that it won't work without the Word. God's got life fixed that it won't work without Jesus. It won't work. You may try it. You may fool with it and tamper with it, but it won't work without Jesus and the Word. It won't. I'm not saying you've got to become a religious fanatic and a religious nut. I don't like religious fanaticism and I don't like religious nuts. I don't. I just love the Lord. I've seen so many religious people, it's turned me off. Friend. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not talking about religious folks. I'm not talking about getting real religious. I'm talking about just falling in love with Jesus, serving Jesus. God's sending His Spirit right now over America one last time. And I've been sent here by the Lord to tell you He's come one last time and He's saying, I'm pouring out my glory in the church. If the church will humble themselves and pray, I'll pour out my glory in any church. If the pastor and the people will let me, I'll come. But when I come, you better take it home and clean your house out. I want everybody in this place, everybody, I'm not going to tarry and I'm not going to waste no time. If you're serious with God, He'll get serious with you. But if you're not serious, I ain't got time to fool with you, friend. I'm tired. 
Today is our 390th service of revival at Brownsville. 390 church services. I'm tired in my body. To be here with you is a miracle. I hadn't got time just for another church service. But God has sent me here to say to you, your house is sterile. And God wants to send His glory to your house. And if you'll let Him, He'll do it. But right now is a time of a reckoning. Right now is a time of decision. You've got to make a decision. I want every person in this place, maybe you've never known God, or maybe you're backslid, or maybe you didn't even know you was backslid, or maybe you've grown cold and indifferent. But I want every person in this church, in just a moment, whenever I give the opportunity, I'm going to open up these altars. I'm not going to beg you, I'm not going to plead with you, and I'm not going to come back there and talk to you. I'm just going to walk back up on the platform and you do what you have to do. I've done what I had to do. Now you do what you have to do. But if you feel like your home is sterile, or you feel like there's sin in your life, and you feel like you need forgiveness, you feel like there's some things you need to get under the blood, and you need to go home and take control of, I'm about to walk up on this platform, and I want you to get up out of your seat. And I believe there's hundreds of you here tonight. I want you to get up out of your seat, and I want you to stand up and walk down this aisle, and we're going to pray together in just a moment. Come on.